Hello everybody. Uh, today we are going to talk about ST elevation, myocardial infarction, the management, how you diagnose, and what are the timelines. And as the, the heading says, STEMI care when time is muscle, because with each minute, you know, there is a continuous damage and infarction to the myocytes. So that's why it's very important that while managing these patients, you should be on top of um, of everything that can lead to patient in the cath lab and revascularized quickly. So with that, we start with what's the criteria for the STEMI. As we all know, it's a very defined and preset criteria that you have to have one millimeter ST elevation in the limb leads, which can be two, three AVF and AVR, and or two millimeter ST elevation in the precordial leads, and that's for the male patients. For the female, it is a little more stricter, strict criteria where it is 1.5 millimeter in the precordial leads, like V1 through V6. The only exception I put a little star here is when you have ST depression, and that we will come when we will be looking at an individual lead. Another part of that definition for meeting the criteria for STEMI is that it has to be in two contiguous leads with some reciprocal changes in the other leads. And one thing that I forgot to mention here was it should be in three consecutive beats. So it can be there might be an artifact, there might be the patient might be moving and there might be a change in the baseline and the ST segment may appear elevated. But if you have somebody who is coming with chest pain and history of coronary artery disease, or if you look at an EKG, by definition, as I said, you have to have these criteria. Of course, there will be here and there some patients which will have mixed presentation, but but nevertheless, one millimeter ST elevation in the limb leads, two millimeter for the male patient and 1.5 millimeter for the female patients in the precordial leads, in two contiguous leads with reciprocal changes and last but not the least in three consecutive beats. If you look here in the center, I'm putting a little arrow here. Um, sometimes we will have some patients in the emergency room where we are trying to make some decision whether they are actively having myocardial infarction or they need to go to the cath lab or there is something else going on and that's why we sometimes order the echo maybe I like a bedside echocardiography but you have to re you have to know one thing is once you made a diagnosis of STEMI, doing any kind of imaging like echocardiogram or something else or like a CT or something is a class three indication. Class three meaning you are doing harm to the patient and that's why I crossed it. You don't want to do that, especially if you have made a decision that the patient is having ST elevation myocardial infarction. And the reason for that is any other procedure or any other delay to the patient care can be fatal. Yes, once the patients meet the criteria for ST elevation myocardial infarction, chest pain, you emergently take the patient to the cath lab, define their coronary anatomy, and if they don't have any culprit, then yes, you can do echocardiogram, you can you know, do cardiac MRI and things like that. But waiting for these tests to be done, delaying the patient care, is doing potentially harm to the patient. Yes, there will be some gray area. There will be some patients who might not meet all the, meet all the strict criteria for the STEMI and then ECHO might help you make a decision and uh, to take the patient to the cath lab and that can be individualized. So with that, we come to the, the right upper quadrant here. And here I have put down some of the leads that you will have to be looking. 
So for patients who have got lateral wall MI, 1 AVL, the limb leads, that will kind of help you determine if the patient is having a lateral wall STEMI. So the lateral wall MI here, I have kind of made this in a yellow indicator here. And if you look at the, the picture one, this is left circumflex. And that's most probably the OM branches or the left circumflex leading to the, the lateral wall MI. Then number two is your 2-3 AVF. As we all know, most probably inferior wall MI. And most commonly it involves the right coronary artery. Occasionally it can also involve the LED, especially if the LED is a big wrap around LED and going and supplying the inferior wall. But by far the most common condition that you will see as depicted in this indicator like a brown is your RCA, inferior wall MI. Occasionally, but not very specific, you might see some time AVR elevation and as shown in pick number three and if you come here on the coronary anatomy it can indicate somebody with left main MI and these patients probably will be doing very poorly they might have plaque rupture in the left main and you have to have a very high level of suspicion even if they don't meet all the criteria for for the STEMI just because this has great mortality and morbidity in these patients, you need to kind of send this patient to the cath lab. Then we come to the anterior, anterior or lateral wall MI from V1 through V6. It's a transition. can tell you if the patient is having anterior, anterosubtal, or even lateral wall MI, lateral wall being supplied by the diagonal branches. So if you have involvement of a LED or a diagonal branch, which is supplying most of the lateral portion of the heart, then you might see these ST elevation through V1 to V6. And here I have shown in picture four. And then LED, as I said, that precordial leads will help you determine if the patient is having MI, either anterior, anteroseptal or the lateral. And last but not the least, as we as I, as I kind of discussed a little in the beginning, if somebody has got a posterior wall MI in lead V1 or V2, you will see what we call like an ST depression. So this is one exception to to the classic definition of STEMI that somebody who's got chest pain meet the criteria, meet all the clinical criteria and history of having. And MI, but you don't see ST elevation. But if you see ST depressions in lead V1 or V2, that kind of should tune you up into thinking of about somebody having a posterior wall MI. So what would be the, the arteries involved? It could be the, the PDA, posterior descending artery or posterior lateral ventricular artery, PLV, V branches. And in these patients, you need to get what we call like a posterior EKG or if there is involvement of right-sided um, or right ventricle, right-sided EKG. So one thing to consider, as I said, it's kind of an exception if you have ST depression in V2 or V2 to V1 or V2. Sometimes uh, some people look at these EKGs and they flip it, like looking at the, at the back from the back and it will appear to you to be like a classic ST elevation if you flip the EKG and look at it in the uh, on the back while facing it um, in front of the light. So with that we come to the second portion of the talk and the, on the left side here um, we'll start with that somebody who's got chest pain and then they call the EMS uh, and, and or they present to the emergency room and the triage nurse thinks that the patient might be having ACS or MI and they do an EKG. So once the patient gets an EKG and they meet the criteria for the, the STEMI, the clock starts ticking. 
and this is where as as the title of this talk the the STEMI care comes down to when time is muscle so this will con constitute a first medical contact whether the patient calls an EMS and the EMS does an EKG in the field or the patient comes to the emergency room and they get that EKG and the decision is made that the patient's got a STEMI so if you go on the right side here on this line if the patient is being transferred to an ambulance really they need to be in the hospital capable of doing PCI within 30 minutes and there should not be wastage of any time in the ER and the patient should go right to the cath lab with the, with the goal directed medical treatment which is to revascularize the patient with PCI within 90 minutes so I know in the past we used to talk about door to balloon time and all that but that's now they, they call it like a first medical contact similarly you can use the door to balloon time especially if the patient comes uh, to the hospital walking by himself or by driven by some with uh, brought in by the family relatives so one exception here is that say for example if the patient is being transferred and the the PCI capable hospital is not available so while I just highlight here like B so so here's where the diversion will take place so if the patient comes to a hospital which is not capable of doing the PCI or if they have they don't have a cath lab then there are two routes if if the patient comes within 30 minutes of the presentation of the chest pain and the PCI capable hospital is far away and and the ER doctor think that they cannot get the patient within 120 minutes to that hospital total of 120 minutes from first medical contact and if it's a very very early presentation within 30 minutes you can make a case of giving these patients TPA we routinely, routinely don't see that but the studies have shown that if the patient presents within 30 minutes the chances of thrombolizing the clots are very high although you have to kind of look at the risks and the benefits the bleeding um, complication that the patient might get with the TPA but nevertheless if it's a very early presentation they benefit from the TPA but if the patient is in a non capable PCI capable hospital but the ER doctor thinks that they can get the patient within a reasonable amount of time to a PCI capable hospital through air care or an ambulance with a total first medical contact to PCI of 120 minutes then they should go ahead and transfer the patient to the PCI capable hospital with the goal of first medical contact to PCI or balloon inflation of 120 minutes so summarizing this first medical contact patient goes to a PCI capable hospital within 90 minutes they should be revascularized if they present to a non PCI capable hospital and there is an involvement of transference of the patient to another hospital you get and you buy another 30 minutes so 90 plus 30, 120 minutes, total 120 minutes for the patients to be getting these revascularization. Once these patients are in the hospital with a PCI capable hospital, if you look at there, I'm a little making arrow here with the PCI. The PCI is the preferred treatment. Yes, this patient can get cabbage. This patient can be getting an intraortic balloon pump. Maybe if they're not doing very well, they can get impeller or never. And last but not the least, if they are doing really poorly, you know, there could be a consideration of ACMO. But by far, if the patient is in the cath lab, PCI is the most preferred or revascularization still remains the gold standard because the longer you delay any kind of intervention, the more myocytes you will be losing. Yes, recently there has been some push in stabilizing these patients if they come in full-blown cardiogenic shock with an impeller 
helping the LV kind of afterload and then at the same time doing the PCI. But if there is something, as I said, if these patients, you know, if you wait for these patients to send them for cabbage or any other other procedure, you, you will be losing time and muscles, which is crucial for the patient, um, long-term morbidity and mortality. So by far, if the patient is in the cath lab, there should be all the effort should be made for these patients to be revascularized. Now let's we come to the last portion of the talk, which is anticoagulation. So these patients get aspirin 325 milligram, P2Y12 inhibitors, clopidogrel or Berlinta or ticagrelor. Can the, these patients can be preloaded with that? For the sake of simplicity, always think of Plavix of 600 milligram. Yes, there will be an exception if somebody is 75 years of age or older, or if they have then some bleeding issues, then you can consider 300 milligram. But by far, we give 600 milligram. Gone are the days where we used to give 300 milligram in the uh, in the ER or pre-procedural. Brelinta is 180 milligram. And the last is your Prasagril or Affian. By design, the Timmy Triton Timmy 30 three trial they did not give the patients the prasagril loading dose in the in, in the emergency room they only got the prasagril once they were in the cath lab and their coronary anatomy was defined so yes if the patient was not loaded with prasagril or clopidogrel or bralenta and you do coronary angiogram and they need a stent then you can load them with prasagril but you cannot preload the patient in the emergency with prasugrel and of course these patients can get heparin 4000 units in the emergency room so that while the procedural or interventional cardiologist will be doing the pci they can adjust the act goal for these patients to be and properly anticoagulated anticoagulated last but not the least i know sometimes there is some hesitancy in not giving these patients clopidogrel or Berlinta thinking that they might be needing cabbage but those will be very obvious patients they will have multivessel disease you already know about them and things like that but you will not see patients going to the cath lab being unstable and then emergently taking for the cabbage usually it does not happen most of the time the the surgeons will say let's Let's get the patient stabilized. We will do, you know, more imaging and things like that. Very, very rarely these patients will be just taken to the, to the, uh, for the cabbage, if they are preloaded with Plavix or the Brelinta. Especially these patients will be doing very, very poorly. Um, and they will have high mortality and morbidity to begin with. They will, you know, you will not be doing anything differently for these patients by not giving them, preloading them with Plavix or Palinta. I hope this was helpful. Um, have a good day.